Hi class, Dr. Jim here. Chapter 23. Chapter 23 is looking at the parasites and that's an interesting one because we can divide these up into three main groups of types of parasites. First we'll talk about the really small guys, the single cell guys known as the protists or the protozoa that cause uh, that are parasites and those are typically found in the intestine. Sometimes they get into other tissues and that but primarily we're thinking of intestinal parasites in that case. And what you're gonna find out in this lecture is that about 10% of the world's population actually has some kind of parasite within them, or probably even more than that, but we're just talking about one type. The second type of parasite is now getting into the animals. Now we're gonna be talking about worms, and these are really what we're thinking of. So if you see the little earthworm crawling around on your ground, that's essentially what people have inside of them. Now, they're not, they some are as developed as the earthworm some are not and again it depends on the type of uh, worm that you might have we describe these as helmets that's the name that the latin name of worm that we give and so we'll talk about some of these different types and again a lot of these are through ingestion of either dirty food or dirty water um, sometimes they can burrow into uh, into the feed and other places and again a lot of times it's associated with contamination of soils with uh, human uh, fecal material in that and so we'll look at those things. The last one is really short We're going to be looking at what we call the ectoparasites The ectoparasites are ones that are on us for a very short amount of time and that's a lot of the insects like the ticks the lice uh, Sometimes we can think of mosquitoes and that and so those are going to be the ones that are very short amount of time on us and then they're away and type of thing. The problem is is they can spread disease as well and so a lot of times their bites transmit either bacteria, viruses, or either other protozoa, especially when we think of mosquitoes and that. And you guys have probably heard a lot about the Zika virus and that with mosquitoes. And so that's one of the things you got to worry about with some of these types of these ectoparasites is the diseases that they bring, not so much them biting you or whatever, but spreading the diseases that you can get. Okay, so that's what we're going to be looking at. The three main types of parasites today, very complex uh, very large chapter, so I'm sorry if this goes a little long. There's a lot to talk about, a lot of things. I don't try and get into too much detail, but I know a lot of you guys are just kind of interested in learning it. I think some really good uh, shows are out there that really can show you a little bit more. Um, the Monsters Inside of Me is always a really good one to see. Uh, I think that's on Animal Planet, and if you get a chance to take a look at that, that will talk about a lot of the parasites that we're going to be discussing here. Another good video, it's a discovery video, and I showed in my class a lot of times, is called uh, Parasites Eating Us Alive. And it kind of goes through the same thing that I'm discussing today. And I think that's a really good video to um, watch. You can get it on Amazon for really cheap and that stuff. You may even find that on YouTube somewhere. But if you type in Parasites Eating Us Alive, that's the video that I think is a really good one to kind of just show you guys a little bit about all three different types of parasites that we're going to be talking about today. Okay, and so hopefully you can make it through the lecture. I try and uh, give you a little bit of everything here and that stuff. I, like I said, I don't go into too much detail. So depending on who your teacher is, they might go into more detail or want expect a little bit more. But I try and give you a good dose of a little bit of everything, talking a little bit about the protozoa, the worms, and then finally the insects that kind of live on us. Okay, and so that's what we're going to be looking at today. So the first thing we're going to talk about is what is parasitology and what are the various types of parasites. So again, I've already mentioned the various types. We're going to look at the three main types. And again, parasitology is the study of looking at parasites. These are animals that animals or organisms living on us or inside of us that are doing us harm. And so we really don't want them there. They're not providing any beneficial benefit. They're actually trying to kill us. And so obviously not having these things in us is the good thing. And that's what we want to do. The first group we'll look at today are the single cell organisms. These are the protozoa. And again, we can break those down typically by how they move. And so we'll look at a couple of these different ones. We have amoebas, we have those that are have flagella, and then finally we have the acomplexian, which have multiple life cycles that go through different stages of life cycles and they change and we call these acomplexian. Or sometimes you may hear them referred to as spore formers. And I think in my lecture today, I discussed more about spore forming, but again, we'll talk a little bit about it. The next group we'll talk about are the helmets and the helmets are the worms. And again, the different diseases that they cause. And again, I'm only scratching the surface. There's lots of worms out there. But a couple of main ones that everyone knows, tapeworms, uh, trichinosis, which is another type of roundworm, 
and that these are some of these ones that we really want to uh, focus in on, especially in the United States. Now, you guys in other countries watching this obviously may have other parasites that you worry about, but for these, we're going to be talking about mainly the ones that affect the United States, but there are some that we do talk about because they're all over the world. Okay, and then finally, the ectoparasites will spend a very short amount of time. These are the insects. And again, they spread a lot of different diseases. And in the next two chapters, we're going to be discussing a lot about some of the viruses that these guys spread. And so we talked a little bit about fungal diseases before, some of the bacteria before, and that, that some of these guys uh, transmit. But the ones today, we're just going to be briefly discussing some of these different guys. And again, the reason why they're ecto is because they're on the outside of our bodies. And typically, they're there for only a short amount of time. Okay, so that's what we're going to be looking at today. Lots of different, lots of variety in the organisms that we're going to be looking at today. All right, so the first group, or first thing we're going to be looking at is parasitology. And again, it's the study of all the eukaryotic parasites. And so this includes protozoas, helmets, and the ectoparasites. And you can see here a wide range of different things. We're going to be talking about roundworms, hookworms, flukes, tapeworms, and nematodes, and the protozoa. We also look at the uh, wonderful guys that can live on us, including fleas, lice, ticks, and I would even include mosquitoes in that category. And again, about 20% of all infectious diseases are spread by these guys. And so if you think of all the different diseases that we've talked about so far, and we're going to be discussing more later on with viruses, about 20% of all those diseases are associated with these, these guys. And like I said, about 10% of the world's population is currently carrying a parasite on them, whether they know it or not. And so that's one of those things that we have to worry about. Now, again, when we're talking about industrialized countries like the United States, Europe, or even some of these bigger countries that have really good health care and that we tend not to see as many parasites. That's because we have clean water, clean food, and we, we pride ourselves on those things. Now, if you go to other countries like second or third world countries, you're going to see that most of the people either suffer from parasites or that is a real cause of disease. And so here in the United States or in Europe, most of the diseases are caused either by bacteria or viruses. And again, those are the things we worry about. In the industrialized, or that's the industrial world, in the rest of the world, the developing world, most of the time you actually see healthcare affected by parasites. And that's because, again, lack of clean water, clean food, and other resources that don't, that aren't common in the, in the industrialized world. So that's where you see that. Okay. All right. So what are the types of parasites? So again, I talked about this before already. We have the single cell organisms, which are called protozoa. And again, these are found in the protus kingdom. So if you remember your four or five kingdoms, whatever you grew up with, now we have the three domains, which are the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. Then you get into the four kingdoms after that. You have the protus, you have the plants, you have the fungi, and you have the animals. Well, the two groups that we're going to be looking at today are the protus, which are the single cell animal-like organisms. And then we have the animals, which are the worms, and then the ectoparasites, which are the insects. And so we're going to look at those today as well. And again, the single cell, these are amoeba. Uh, we have the flagella, and then we have the acomplexia. And so again, these are associated primarily with how they move. Now, the amoeba kind of moves around. So if you've ever seen the movie The Blob or whatever, if you've ever seen an amoeba kind of moving on the screen, it uses these pseudopods to kind of help it move around. And so they kind of crawl real slowly and move through. The flagellated or the flagella uh, parasites have flagella that allow them to move. And again, in eukaryotes, it kind of whips around like a snake. And so you think of sperm cells moving around. Well, that's how these guys move. And the acomplexian, a lot of times we associate with these with spores. But the why they're called acomplexian is that they have many different life cycles. Some of these are transmitted through vectors like mosquitoes or bugs or other things. Some of these are transmitted through different stages, life stages, depending on where you might pick these up. So eating them or drinking them or, or something else. And they may be in other animals at the same time. The helmets are going to be your worms. And again, we have lots of different ones. We can divide these into two different groups. We have the round worms. And again, round worms look round. And then you have the flat worms, which are they're going to be more flattened. And they're going to have a lot of times uh, with the flat worms, you're going to see individual what we call proglottids with the tapeworms and that. We also include flukes. They kind of look like leeches, but leeches are in a separate category. They're more like earthworms. Whereas the flukes are a flatworm. And again, those can infect a lot of different parts of the body. And you're going to see that today. I bring up a couple different types of flukes that can infect people. 
The last group is the ectoparasites. And again, this includes the ticks, the fleas, and the lice. And these are going to be, again, more of the either arachnids, if you're talking about ticks, or if you're talking about the fleas and the louse or lice, these are going to be uh, more of insecta variety. So we'll look at these guys as well. Okay, and again, ecto, because they live on the outside of our body, typically you don't have insects growing on the inside of you, typically on the outside. Okay, so let's start with the protozoan. And again, these are the single cell in the protus kingdom. Uh, single cell typically have lots of different things going on. And again, we divide these groups on how they move. So think of locomotion. Okay, so these guys are single cell animal-like microbes, having most having some form of motility. And again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. There's roughly about 100,000 species, but 25 of those 100,000 are medically important or pathogens that we worry about. The life cycles vary. Again, some of them have a very complex life cycle that can go through many different stages. Typically, they have either a sexual cell, which allows them to reproduce, and then they have the active state. And so a lot of times refer to those as the trophozyte. And so the trophozyte is the active stage. Then you have the reproductive stage, which can be described as a different way. Um, some do form cysts, and that allows them to get through the digestive system. So if we think about these uh, parasites that get into the digestive system, they have to get through the, the nasty acid of our stomachs. And then one way to uh, combat that is forming this calcified cyst, which allows them to survive the digestic acids that we have. And so they can get into the intestine that way. Uh, others have, again, asexual and sexual phases, and this just breaks down into how do they reproduce Asexual means that they make clones of themselves. They basically reproduce their DNA, go through mitosis, and split into two cells. The sexual means that they have a boy and girl, and they mix sperm and egg together and form a new offspring. And so that's more mixing of the genes. And so that's how that happens. Okay? And so these are some of the guys we're going to look at. Trypanosomes, which is typically a blood parasite, causes African sleeping sickness. And so we see this. This is caused by when you get bit by a fly. The parasite enters into your blood and then can cause disease. This giardia, see it kind of has the happy face, the two eye spots and the happy face. These are actually nuclei. And then the little happy face on it, it's not so happy if you get it. This is a waterborne one. So this is very common in areas where you drink water that hasn't been uh, filtered or purified or chlorinated in that. And these get into the water supply and can get you really sick. And so it causes gastrointestinal distress. And so... This is one that it has kind of like a little suction cup and will kind of stick to your intestine and cause a nice, wonderful case of diarrhea for a couple of days. And so that's that's typically what you get with Giardia. Okay, and so again, here are some of the different protozoa that cause these different diseases. And again, we're going to be looking at some of these. We'll first start with the amoeboid, which are, again, the ones that kind of crawl around. And these two, most of the time, most people get is the intermebia, intermebia, which is the one that causes the gastrointestinal problems. But there are some that cause brain infections. And so, and this is not uncommon even in the United States, where you have traumatic injury either to the eye or to the nose, and these guys will actually crawl in. And so where we've actually seen this a few times, if you guys use a neti pot, make sure you use saline or boil your water first, because if you use just plain old tap water, there is a chance, I mean a remote chance, that one of these guys could get in. And so if you do use a neti pot, you want to be very careful and use saline or boiled water because you want to make sure you don't accidentally put one of these guys into your nose, which can then work its way into your brain. Okay, we'll talk very quickly about the ciliated protozoa. And actually, I probably, I think I skipped that today with the this. If you want to learn more about that, typically it's found from pigs and that. I like to move on to the flagellated because there's quite a few more, including Giardia, uh, Trichomonasis, which is a um, STD, and then the ones that get into the blood, either trypanosomes or leishmania, which get into get in through bites of an insect and then get into your body, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Then the last three that I like to talk about are the acomplexian, and again, these are spore formers or they do other things, can be passed. The first one, obvious, is malaria. Malaria is a nasty pathogen. It kills more people as a parasite than anything else out there. So this is the most deadly pathogen or parasite that's out there that we think of is malaria, and that's spread by mosquitoes. Uh, toxoplasma, which is actually found from your cats. And so if any of you are pregnant, this is why your doctor tells you not to change kitty litter because, or change your cat litter because cats actually carry this in their intestines. 
And with the dust of cat litter, if you ever change cat litter, you know the dust goes everywhere. Well, breathing that in can actually get you these different plasmids. Now, it doesn't really do much to the mom, but it can cross the placenta and cause damage to the fetus. And so you don't want to avoid that. And so that's why your doctor says you're done changing cat litter if you are pregnant because you don't want to take that risk. The last one I talk about is cryptosporosis. And the reason why I talk about that one is in Milwaukee, we had a massive outbreak about, oh, now it's been about 25 years ago, well, actually closer to 20, 20 years ago in the water supply and that there was cryptosporidium. And this led to a lot of different problems. A lot of people had chronic diarrhea for a number of weeks. People that had weakened immune systems actually died from this disease. And so this is one of those first of the major waterborne infections. And so when we think of cryptosporidium here in Milwaukee, that is a one of those things that people puts kind of the fear into them when you hear that because it really did a lot of damage here in Milwaukee. And so it even forced us to build a new water treatment plant because of what happened. And so that's one of those things. And so by that, by having this scare, Milwaukee probably has some of the safest water in the world and saying that just because of the different levels of treatment that it actually goes through. And we bring that water from Lake Michigan and then it gets treated through a number of different ways in order to be safe when it comes out of your faucet. Okay, so that's some of the different protozoans that we're going to look at today. All right, so the first one is the Entamoeba histolytica and causes amoeba basis. Okay, and again, the basically what happens is humans are the primary host. And again, what happens is the cysts are swallowed and arrive in the small intestine. These alkaline pHs and digestive juices stimulate the cysts to release and these trophozytes come out and integrate into the intestines. They attach, multiply, and then they can move about freely in the intestines. They stay in the intestines, but they cause you some damage in the intestinal wall. They get released, they re keep reproducing, you shed amoebas in the feces and that, and this is how this spreads through contaminated feces, which either gets into the water or into the soil, okay? It's asymptomatic in about 90% of patients, but those that do get it, get a uh, bout of diarrhea, some fever, abdominal pain. Now, it secretes enzymes that dissolves tissues and can penetrate deeper, de deeper layers of the mucosa, can cause dysentery, abdominal pain, fever, diarrhea, and weight loss. And again, this is carried by about 10% of the world's population. So like I said, in other areas other than the United States and Europe, we see a lot of this stuff. And you can see actually here, there's some erosions in the intestine where this amoeba got in and actually dissolved parts of the intestine. And so this is one of those things that can cause a lot of damage if, and especially if you don't have any symptoms, you don't even know it's there. And so this is why, Again, it can be spread very easily. It gets in uh, the feces, the feces, the feces gets into the water and people drink the water that's been contaminated. So again, not clean water, dirty soils, things like this. This is what leads to the spread of this disease. Now, again, it can cause life-threatening manifestations. It can lead to hemorrhage, perforation, and appendicitis and tumor-like growth. And we call these amoeba domas. It can invade the liver and lung, and there are uh, severe forms of the disease that can result into about 10% fatality rate. And again, there are some drugs, but again, they're more like us, so they're very few and kind of limited. And so you can see the drugs down here. Now, what's interesting is that some of these guys can actually get into the brain, and so we call these amoebic infections of the brain, and this is caused by the uh, Nigeria flowerii and, and canthamoebia, and again, they originally inhabit standing water. And so this is where we tend to see this. When you have flooding, you have dirty water and people go swimming in those flood waters, or again, maybe they get trapped in the flood waters and they start swimming in it. And what happens is you get this traumatic injury. A stick jabs someone in the eye. You, when you breathe in that water, maybe you get washed out into the, the, the water or whatever, if you have um, high level rivers rising and that stuff. And what happens is water gets in the nose and into the mouth and people actually drink the water. And what happens is amoebas can actually work their way through their brain. Now, if it does get into the brain, there's really not much you can do because the amoebas in their brain, there's not a way to attack it. It goes in and it starts eating away at the brain. And obviously this is not, it's something that most people want eating at your brain and that stuff. And again, it can cause uh, death if, if it goes too long. And so, yeah, once it gets into the brain, there's not much you can do. And so this does happen in the United States. There's actually been a couple of cases reported even here in Wisconsin where this happens. And that's where the amoeba gets in and goes through. 
Now, earlier I was talking about the neti pots. That is possible that some people, and I've heard this actually happening too, this is not some kind of rumor or wives' tale that this could occur. But what happens is the water gets in through the neti pot, and again, you use non-sterilized water or non-saline, gets in and it causes you an infection through the nose and into the sinus cavity and cause disease that way. So that could occur. So when you have a neti pot and you use it, make sure you either boil the water first or you use saline that comes along with it so that you are sure that it's safe, that you're not putting something up your nose that shouldn't be up there, okay? So that, that's something to tell you about right there. All right, so Entamoeba histolytica primarily invades which part of the body? Does it invade the liver, the large intestine, small intestine, or the lungs? Which one do you see the Entamoeba histolytica? Okay, in this case, this guy actually infects the small intestine because he gets in and then the pH of the small intestine allows it to release out of the cysts. And so we see this in the small intestine more than the large intestine. So if you said small intestine, yeah, I got it right. Good job. All right, so the next one is the trichomonads, and this is the one that causes uh, the STD, trichomonasis. And so this is the trichomonasis species. It's a small pear-shaped species. You can kind of see it has some flagell on it, has the nucleus in the center, and it has another axial style on the end. Okay, it has four anterior flagella and an undulating membrane. So it kind of looks like a jellyfish moving in the water, if you think about it that way. Exists only as a trophozyte form, and again, that's the one that's the free moving or free stage. And there are three types that infect humans, including the T. vaginalis, the T. tenex, and the T. homans. And again, we're going to study the T. vaginalis here, and that's a major cause of an STD. Now, Trichomonas vaginalis causes the STD known as trichomonasis. And again, you can see it here. This is under the microscope of what it looks like. The reservoir is the human urogenital tract, and about 50% of infected are asymptomatic. However, the other 50% see this as uh, a major infection. Okay, It's a strict parasite, cannot survive long outside the host, and there's about 3 million cases per year in the United States. So it's a top STD in the United States. In females, it's foul-smelling green to yellow discharge, causes vulvitis, cervicitis, urinary frequency, and pain. Males see the same thing, urethritis, a thin milky discharge, and occasionally a prostate infection. Again, metronidazole is the treatment that's used. That's the fungal treatment. And again, you see this a lot of times as a treatment there. Again, a lot like us, so difficult to treat. It's not like a bacterial STD where you can give it a lot of different drugs and hopefully it works. This one, a lot like us. And again, it stays with the tissue. It grows inside the mucous membranes. does a very good job of uh, doing that. But again... 50% don't even see any symptoms and they may be carrying it around. And so that's one of those things. So again, protected sex will prevent this from spreading. But anytime you have any problems down there, you should always go get it checked out. Okay. And so that's the big thing. But a big STD is actually caused by eukaryotic parasite. And most people don't even think about that. All right. Another one is Giardia, and Giardia, Giardia is the happy face, or the, the two eyes and the happy face parasite. And again, it's not a happy thing to get this. It is, again, a, a flagellate, and again, it has unique symmetrical heart shape with concave ventral surface. This acts like a suction, a suction cup, and you can kind of see here. And this, what it does is it sticks to the wall of the intestine. The cysts are small, so here's the cyst, and it gets in. You drink this cyst into the contaminated water. Then it breaks out once it gets into the intestine. And again, we see this in areas where you're out in the woods. Beavers, ca cattle, coyotes, cats, and humans are all carriers for this. And again, anytime you have feces mixing in with water, there's always the potential for this disease to spread. And again, the cyst can survive for two months in the environment, meaning that it doesn't have to be utilized. It can be sitting out in the water for about two months for you to come and drink it. Once you get it, then you get the infection itself. Now, Giardia will cause Giardaceus, and again, it's usually ingested with water or food, and it only takes 10 to 100 cysts to really get you sick. Now, what happens is it enters into the duodenum, it germinates, it then travels to the middle one, the jejunum, and that's where it feeds and multiplies. And so you see this in the center part of the small intestine, it causes Giardaceus, which is diarrhea and abdominal pain is associated with this, it's difficult because you don't shed this very often. So when we think of shedding, we think of releasing eggs and so in or these cysts. 
And so it doesn't, doesn't always, it's infrequent. So a lot of times what we have to do in order to determine what type of parasite you have, you have to look in people's poop. I know it's not one of those things that you want to think about, but this is one of the ways we diagnose the infection. And so you have to look for either the cyst or the eggs in the feces itself to see if people do that. And sometimes in this guy, it isn't always that common. Again, in this one, it's quinacrine or metronidazole. And again, this is used to, uh, again, for treatment. And again, we can kill it by either boiling, using ozone or iodine. So if you're a frequent camper and that stuff, always either boil your water or treat it with a filtration system or one of those iodine um packets that you can buy at a camping store that will eliminate this need and again this is out in nature this is typically where most people get this disease is by going camping and seeing oh it's a running stream it should be clean water well these guys sit in the clean water you drink that water you get the cyst in you gets in and now you have a eukaryotic parasite so that's typically where we see this Again, contaminated water, but a lot of different areas can see this. And again, typically you don't see this a lot of times in water, in, in purified water or water that comes through, but it can occur if you do have any mechanical breakdown somewhere in the system and it can get in. And so you do hear sometimes about outbreaks of Giardia in water treatment or water supplies where water supplies have been down. And so always, whenever you hear a boil warning, always take that into account. You should always boil your water either with E. coli or one of these guys in there and these things will be eliminated. All right, now we get into the uh, hemoflagellates. These are guys that are actually parasites in the blood. And so these are obligate parasites that live in the blood and tissues of the human host and they cause life-threatening and de de uh, debilitating zoonosis. So again, things that get spread from one animal to another. It's spread in specific tropical regions by blood-sucking insects that serve as an intermediate host. And we're going to talk about two different types of diseases. The first one is going to be uh, the one called African sleeping sickness, and this is spread by a, a tsetse fly. The second one is called Chagas disease, and you see this in Central and South America, and this is spread by this wonderful thing called the kissing bug. And I'll talk a little bit more about this here in a few minutes. They have complicated life cycles and undergo morphological changes and they're categorized by cellular and infective stages. And you can see here, here's the parasite in a blood smear. And so you can see the blood cells, here's the wonderful parasite. So it kind of looks like little seagulls or wings inside or little worms inside the blood. And that's what these guys kind of look like. Okay, the first group is the trypanosome and this causes trypanosomomasis. And again, it's distinguished by their infective stage the trypanozygote, and again, it's an elongate spindle-shaped cell with tapered ends. Kind of looks like an eel, uh, an eel-like motility, so it kind of swims through the fluid or the blood. And again, the two that we worry about is the T. brucei, which is the one that causes African sleeping sickness, and then the T. cruzi, which causes Chagas disease in Central and South America. So here's the T. brucei, and then here's the T. cruzi, which is the one that we see with the um, uh, Chagas disease. Okay, so again, the first one is the T, uh, trypanosome brucei, and again, this one is spread by tsetse flies, and there's two different strains, and again, in different parts of Africa that we see this, and what happens is by the biting fly, the biting fly bites into the skin, and uh, basically inoculates your blood with this parasite, gets into your blood, which then can travel to the brain, and this can be an interval of many different years, which can then multiply in the blood, damages the spleen, the lymph nodes, and the brain, and so it can cause a lot of different problems leading to uh, CNS. Once it gets to the brain, that's where the most damage occurs, and this is where that African sleeping sickness, you really start to see those symptoms. And what happens is that essentially you get periods of, again, coma and other things that happen where it's into the brain and causing a lot of different problems. Okay, so again, this is the area endemic with African sleeping sickness. It's carried by mammals. And again, it's a chronic disease that symptoms are sleep disturbances, tremors, paralysis, and coma. And again, trypanosomes are readily demonstrated in the blood, spinal fluid, or lymph nodes. And again, treatment before the neurological involvement. Anytime things get to the brain, that usually signifies major damage. This can lead to severe problems, coma and death in these places. And again, the best way to control this is by getting rid of the fly. And so if we can eliminate the fly, we can eliminate the disease. Okay. And so that's where we see this. Now, another 
uh, organism is called the trypanosome cruzi, and that is causing Chagas disease. Now, Chagas is spread by this bug called the kissing bug. And again, this kissing bug bites other animals, and it spreads the disease uh, to humans. And so how this happens is the bug will land on you in the middle of the night. It is attracted to your carbon dioxide, and it comes up by the edge of your mind mouth, bites your mouth, and then poops in it. So really lovely animal here. Poops in, in your sore, and that will lead to the infection. So bug feces inoculated in the cutaneous portal. You get this local lesion, fever, swelling of the lymph nodes, can go to the spleen and liver and lead to a lot of other diseases. So typically where we see this a lot of times is in children, and then later in life they have problems where this spreads and causes more disease. So they get heart damage, lung damage, liver damage, a lot of different organs become enlarged and swollen and can cause serious problems in later in life. Okay, so again, heart muscle and large intestine harbor mass, masses of these um, uh, mastozygotes. And again, chronic inflammation occurs in the organs, especially the heart and brain. Here you can see abnormal enlargement of the heart due to the Chagas disease. And again, there are some treatments for it, but earlier treatment is better. So as a kid, you want to get these treatments so that it doesn't lead to increased swelling of the organs and prolonged swelling of these organs that can lead to damage later in life. And so that's always the issue. The more damage you get as a kid that you don't do or you don't do something about, you do recover. However, now you have this the rest of your life, so that puts you at risk for a lot of other diseases as you get older. And again, your heart may give out, your liver may um, fail. You may have problems with um, other problems as well in this, and especially in the brain. And so obviously if it gets into the brain, that can cause serious problems. And that's where we see most of the death associated with this disease. Okay. Now another one that's spread by um, flies is called Leishmania. Now Leishmania is typically what we call a, is typically associated with skin infections and that. It's a zoonosis transmitted among mammalian hosts by female sand flies that require a blood meal. Now we see this more and more with uh, soldiers that go to the area of the Iraq or Afghanistan because we have lots of sand, lots of sand flies, and we've seen these things, and they've been described as what we call bagged up boils. What these things are is these guys, these fly bite, and they cause these ulcerative sores due to the infection that they cause. And so I'll show you here a picture of this. And so what happens in Leishmania, the prone mastozygotes are injected by the sand fly and they convert into a metozygote and multiply. The macrophage does not migrate the infection. It stays localized in the skin. However, it can come systemic if it does migrate. And so it ends up in these wonderful macrophages, and these can be transporters throughout the body. So hopefully it stays localized. And if it stays localized, you get this nasty ulcerative skin disformity. Otherwise, it can come systemic and cause problems with the organs later on. Here's an example of the Baghdad boil, very ugly looking disformation, ulcerative uh, sore. Again, it's a continuous orient oriental sore. With the Baghdad boil, it's a localized ulcerated sore. A spunda is the skin and mucous membranes of the head and chronic infection. It's systemic, can get into high intermittent fever, weight loss, and large spleen, liver, and lymph nodes. And the Kala Azar is the most severe and fatal form if left untreated. So again, get bit by these sand flies. These sand flies transmit the disease into the blood. They either stay locally and cause a very nasty ulcerative sore, or they can spread throughout the body and cause infection in other parts, especially in the spleen, liver, and also in the lymph nodes. And so you'll see that as well. Okay. All right. So the hemoflagellates are transmitted by what? Mosquito bites, insect vectors, bug feces, or contaminated food. So the hemoflagellates were the trypanosomes, and that was the trypanosome um, brucei and the trypanosome cruzi. So which two are spread by this? Is that uh, by mosquito bites, insect vectors, bug feces, or contaminated food? You said insect vectors, you would be correct. So again, the black fly or the tsetse fly is the one that spreads the trypanosome uh, brucei and then the, the trypanosome uh, uh, cruzi, which crosses Chagas, is actually carried by the, the kissing bug, but then it does spread through the bug feces. So I, I guess if you said bug feces, I'd give it to you too. But in this case, we're thinking insect vectors that actually carry it. Okay. All right, moving on. So now we're going to look at the last three of the um, 
these guys of the single cell protozoa and this includes things like plasmodium which is your malaria toxoplasma and the cryptosporidium uh, and so those are the three that we're going to look at these are known as sporozoans because they make spores at some point in time in your life they're called acomplexing because they have again complicated life cycles they alternate between sexual and asexual phases between the different animal hosts and again most forms specialized infective bodies that are transmitted by arthropods food water other means and again we'll see some of these and so plasmodiums transmitted by mosquitoes toxoplasma is typically in the form of cysts that again are passed by your kitty cats and then cryptosporidium again is ones those are cysts they get into the water typically contaminated water and then they get into the water supply and then people drink those and get into the intestines the first one we'll look at is plasmodium this is the agent of malaria and it's a dominant protozoan disease again more people die of this parasite than any other parasite in the world so again this is eliminated or it's limited to the tropical regions the united states eliminated the mosquito back in the 1930s and 40s so typically we see it in central south america africa and then again the lower areas of the southeastern asia and in the uh, tropical pacific islands okay spread by the Anopheles mosquito and again blood transfusions and mother to fetus but primarily the Anopheles mosquito is the primary vector of this and again there's anywhere from 300 to 500 million new cases that's new cases every year and anywhere from about two to three million deaths every year from this disease so by far the most killing most infective parasite that's out there okay is malaria all right so again, malaria has two distinct phases. The first one is the asexual phase, and that's when it is the human host. So what happens is, is that again, what the mosquito comes in, it bites you on the arm or the leg or wherever, and what happens, it releases these sporozytes that go into the liver. Once it gets into the liver, it then gets into these wonderful liver cells, and then it starts reproducing into these merozoites. These merozoites then form in the liver cells, they get released, and then they end up into the red blood. So we'll take a look at that. So again, what happens is that it gets into the liver, and there goes this thing called schizony. And what schizony means is basically it's a form of mitosis where these cells just go in through this rapid growth and division that takes place very quickly. You get these merozoites, and then it enters circulation depending on the species anywhere for five to sixteen days. Once it gets into the blood, that's when you start to see the symptoms of this. And again, these merocytes attach and enter into the red blood cells. Again, coming from the liver, lots of blood there. They get into the red blood cells and they convert to these trophozytes, which multiply. What happens is they get inside the red blood cells. They form these trophozytes, which are these gametes, and that form into a lot of different gametes. And then they release into the blood. And so what happens is, is people that have, have malaria undergo anemia because what happens is all your red blood starts still start rupturing and releasing these parasites into the blood and so what they're looking for is the next mosquito to come and bite you so that then they can take these merozoites or trophozytes and then take those have sexual reproduction inside the mosquito and start the process all over again and so that's the idea and so this is a very complicated life cycle of the parasite but it's not a really good thing for humans. And so this life cycle is very damaging, not only to the liver, but it's very damaging to the blood. And so that's where these things get passed. If you're talking about blood transfusions and it's not caught, it can be spread to people through blood transfusions, it can cross the placenta and infect the fetus. And so if mom is infected with malaria, it can cause that disease. And then likewise, yourself, you've got lots of issues where it's rupturing the red blood cells, causing liver damage, a lot of things that can occur due to this disease itself. Okay, so let's take a look. And I think the next video is actually, gonna, or, and then I guess the mosquito phase is the last one. And again, what happens is you draw in their uh, infected red blood cells, the gametes fertilize inside the mosquito, mosquito, and the process starts all over again. The sporozytes in the stomach, they end up in the salivary glands, and now the process starts all over where you have the infection again. And you can kind of see this going on and on and on as a phase. But think of basically getting into the liver, gets into the liver and then reproduces in the liver through the schizony gets into the blood cells the blood cells then either rupture or form gametes those blood cells are pulled up by the mosquito 
and then the process starts all over again. So that's the idea of how malaria spreads. Okay, so let's take a look at this video and I think this will give you a really good idea of how this actually occurs. When a female Anopheles mosquito penetrates human skin to obtain a blood meal, it injects saliva mixed with an anticoagulant. If the mosquito is infected with plasmodium, it will also inject elongated sporozoites, modal spindle-shaped asexual cells, into the bloodstream of its victim. The sporozoites travel to the liver where they enter liver cells and rapidly divide asexually. This asexual division, which is called schizogony, generates the next life cycle form called merozoites. The released merozoites invade other liver cells and enter the host's bloodstream where they invade erythrocytes. Once inside the erythrocyte, the merozoite begins to enlarge as a uninucleate cell termed a ring trophozoite. The trophozoite's nucleus then divides asexually to produce a schizont which contains several nuclei. The schizont then divides and produces mononucleated merozoites. The erythrocyte ruptures and releases toxins throughout the body of the host bringing about the well-known cycle of fever and chills that is characteristic of malaria. Plasmodium enters a sexual phase when some merozoites in the erythrocytes develop into gametocytes, cells capable of producing both male and female gametes. Erythrocytes containing gametocytes do not rupture. Gametocytes are incapable of producing gametes within their human hosts and do so only when they are extracted from an infected human host by a mosquito. Within the gut of the mosquito, the gametocytes form male and female gametes. The resultant diploid zygotes develop within the mosquito's intestinal walls and ultimately differentiate into oocysts. Within the oocysts, repeated mitotic divisions take place, producing large numbers of sporozoites. These sporozoites migrate to the salivary glands of the mosquito, and from there are injected by the mosquito into the bloodstream of a human, thus starting the life cycle of the parasite again. Okay, so that kind of shows you the whole cycle. I think the video does a really nice job, so I probably, like I said, the biggest things that I want you to get out of it is that you go from the infection through the mosquito goes to the liver then it goes to the blood once it, it changes in the liver gets into the red blood cells red blood cells both form gametes and rupture and release more of these guys into the blood and that's where you get a lot of your symptoms and then the process can start over because the mosquito will take a new blood meal pull in those parasites it then multiplies in the stomach and then travels to the salivary glands where the process can start all over again and now in fact or humans with the infection and so that's how this thing all occurs okay so again what are the symptoms of plasmodium or malaria and that includes episodes of chills fever sweating and it kind of goes in this 48 to 72 hour cycle of this chills fever sweating chills fever sweating you can get anemia because all your red blood cells are rupturing at the same time and again it can cause organ enlargement so here's a list of all the different neurological problems that you can see Again, you can have jaundice because of the liver damage, can cause liver failure. You get a dry cough, which is a respiratory. Sometimes you get fever associated with. You can get a headache, nervous system problems associated with this, again, because it's in the blood. You get the chills and sweating, fatigue and pain. You can get kidney failure because of the par parasites into the kidneys and that. Gastric can cause nausea and vomiting. So a lot of different problems that can be associated with this. And again, the um, symptoms occur at 48 to 72 hours, and that's due to the red blood cell rupture. And so you'll get these swings and chills, fever, uh, sweating, chills, fever, sweating over and over again. And again, uh, the plasmodium falciparum is the most malignant type, and it's the highest death rate in children. Diagnosis is by looking for the trophozyte in the red blood cells. And so here you can see the trophocytes inside the red blood cells and what that looks like. We are seeing increasing drug resistance, and one of the problems is, is that there's not a lot of good drugs to actually treat this disease. And then again, the only two that are really out there are quinine, quinine and chloroquinine, which is from the bark of a tree, 
And this has been around for about 400 years. And that has been the only treatment that we've had. We've tried vaccines and other things and nothing has worked as well as quinine. And so that's where we see most of the problems. And so that's what we see in these situations. Okay, now another disease that affects people is known as toxoplasma. And this is caused by toxoplasma gondii. And again, it's carried in the intestines of, of your uh, kittens or cats, especially if they're outdoors. If they're indoor cats, it's less of a risk, but again, I would always associate and just being safe and not worrying about uh, dealing with this. But if you definitely have an outdoor cat, then I would not, if you were pregnant, you do not want to be changing your cat litter. Okay, it lives naturally in the cats and it's harbored by the oocysts in the GI tract. And again, it's acquired by ingesting either raw meats or substances contaminated by cat feces. And again, when you're changing the cat litter, you know how the dust goes in and you probably breathe that in. And along with that dust, you're carrying some of those cysts along with the, the fecal material and fine particles. And so that's why your doctor is telling you do not change cat litter when you're pregnant. Because what can happen is those cysts get into you, can get into the environment in different animals, get in the muscle and that can occur or again, can directly be infected by just changing the process of changing the cat litter, breathing in that dust along with the oocytes. It doesn't necessarily affect mom too bad, but it can cross the placenta and cause uh, premature uh, death in the fetus, obviously. It can cause uh, other problems where developmental issues and other things like that, and can be, like I said, severe enough to it couldn't cause uh, the fetus to die uh, during, um, during pregnancy. Okay. Now, again, most cases of toxoplasma go unnoticed, except in the fetus. And again, people that have uh, AIDS or immune suppression, and so they can suffer brain and heart damage because these guys can go in there and that you have a well robust immune system, it doesn't affect you. But again, those that have a problem with that. Now, again, there are some treatments, but how does the fetus get this? It's through the placental connection with the infected mother and it can be an infected by improper handling a cat litter or handling and ingesting contaminated meat. So either way, this is why your doctor says stay away from lunch meat, not only the listeriosis, but also the toxoplasma and then the cat litter. This is why you don't change it. So if you never knew why, this is why the toxoplasma. Now you know. Excuse me. Now, the last one we're going to talk about here is cryptosporidium, and this is a recognized intestinal pathogen, and this is one that's more, uh, an intestinal pathogen, and it's going in the last 20 years, has gotten a big name for itself because of the infection and the contamination in Milwaukee. And so, again, it affects a variety of mammals, birds, and reptiles, and it exists in tissue and oocyst phases, but typically what happens is people drink contaminated water gets in through the cyst, gets into the digestive system, and then opens up, and then these sporozytes then release uh, and cause digestive issues. Now, where we saw the biggest outbreak of this was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, back in the early 90s, I think it was 93, 94, when this actually happened, and it was uh, enough in the water supply that it caused about 370,000 cases. So if you lived in Milwaukee that year, you probably got the disease and it was due to contaminated water. And again, filtration was required for removal. What this did was it put not only panic in the in, in people wondering if their water was clean, but it also made sure that, hey, we need to do something to make sure that we have safe water. So Milwaukee added different layers to their water supply. They actually built a new water treatment plan associated with this. And now Milwaukee probably has one of the cleanest water supplies in the world based on this parasite. There still is some debate of how this parasite actually got in. There's been some indication that it may have been brought back by a traveler that had the disease and then again got into the wastewater. The wastewater then got into the water supply that way. Others have argued that may it may have been due to runoff from uh, farms upriver and came down the river and some of the animals had the infection and then got it that way and through and got into the water supply. But we do know it got in the water supply, caused lots of disease, and where we really saw the issues was in people that had weakened immune systems, and those were the ones that actually died from the disease. Now again, the oocytes give rise to the sporozytes, which penetrate the intestinal cells, and you can see them here, very, very small. Causes gastroenteritis, headaches, sweating, vomiting, abdominal cramps, and diarrhea. Sounds like your wonderful 24-hour flu, but this is something that's chronic. This can last for weeks, if not treated, and again, 
There's no effective drugs to treat it. And again, where we saw the most issues was in the people that had uh, AIDS and other immune problems. So people that were on transplants, people that were on immunosuppressive drugs. These are the ones that suffered the most. And again, getting in the water supply, that can be a nasty thing because how does this thing get in there? And then is your water safe? And so again, that was one of the big concerns at the time. And so this was a huge outbreak that affected thousands and thousands of people at one time. And again, thinking of your water supply that you take for granted every day, being contaminated with a parasite, that's a scary thing. And especially when it's killing people, very, very scary. Okay. And so that's why cryptosporidium now is one of these big ones that we worry about because it has gotten into water supplies and it can cause major outbreaks like this. Okay. And so that brings us to the end of the different types of parasites of the, uh, of the protozoan variety. Now we're going to get ourselves into the worms and start looking at the worms in the next, next couple of slides. Okay. So how can a person acquire toxoplasmosis? Is it in the raw meat? Is it in the air? Cleaning out the cat litter box or all of these? And if you said all of these, you would be correct. And again, these things do travel in the air. They can be breathed in. So that's what I said, it gets into the dust and in that, clean out the litter box, and it can also be in the meat itself. And so all of these can cause the disease. So you have to be very careful, especially if you're pregnant, not to be around cat litter boxes and that stuff. You know, you don't want to get rid of your cat and that stuff. Maybe you have allergies and that's, and that's a different issue altogether. But obviously you want to avoid the litter box in the area where the litter box is. So if it's in your basement, you might want to avoid that area and that stuff because those things can travel in the air and cause disease as well. All right, so let's take a look and spend a little bit of time looking at the worms. And so the worms are animals now. So now we're talking about the animal kingdom. They're very much like us. A lot of them have developed digestive systems, have developed reproductive systems, and a lot of them have very good sense of where they are. And so they know what they're doing. They know how to get in there. And we'll talk about how these things get in in a, different, a number of different ways. So I'll show you a slide that actually shows you four different ways that these guys actually can get into the body. Okay. So again, adults are large multicellular animals with specialized tissues and organs. The adult worms mate and produce fertilized eggs. And so we associate eggs uh, and releasing of eggs that you see in the feces. And so that's one of the ways to determine whether or not someone's infected with worms is by either finding worms in the feces or finding the eggs in the feces. A lot of the um, worms can be hermaphrodites, meaning they have both sexes in them. And again, in adulthood, the mating can occur in a definitive host. And a lot of times that's the humans. There are larvae a lot of times that form an immediate, intermediate host. And a lot of times these are snails or aquatic animals. And I'll talk a little bit about that today. Uh, again, the transport host doesn't really suffer as much as the final or definitive host, which is typically the human or large animal that it affects. And again, I'll show you the four basic uh, patterns of life and transmission. And again, these typically are either round worms. So you can see here, here are the little hooks on these guys. Those are the hooks that bind onto your intestine. You can see this is a nice big tube or round worm. And you can see here's an intestine that is infected with a lot of worms in this case. And so obviously you see this worm outbreak and this can be a nasty, nasty thing. Okay, here's a list of all the different types of worms. Again, I'm not gonna go through all these things. We're gonna be talking about some of these uh, today in the lecture and that stuff and looking at them, but you can see most of them are found in humans and again spread to humans this way. These are the same types of worms that you will see in your dogs and cats when we talk about heartworm or some of the other worms that get into their intestines and that stuff. These are the same things that we discuss and humans get these a lot of times too. And so again, we'll look at round worms first and then we'll spend a little bit of time on the flat worms, which includes the tapeworms and the flukes. And so we'll look at a couple of these different types. Okay, most of them stay in the intestines, but there are a few that get into other spots of the body and we'll talk about that as well. But typically when we associate worms, we think of intestines and getting these through uh, contaminated meat or water products. So we'll look, this is how, again, the larvae get in. So the typical one is cycle A, where again, contaminated food or water is eaten or drink, drunk. And again, it's brought in. They enter into the intestines as cysts, they release into the intestines, and then they release lots of eggs that get into the environment, and then they manifest into either dirty or contaminated water. 
Cycle B is a little interesting because this is more of a uh, one where, again, part of the time is in the intestines. The worms, though, itself get, again, releasing of eggs that get into the soil. And these larvae actually will burrow through people when they wear bare feet. Or so when they have bare feet or don't wear any shoes, I should say, not wearing shoes. And they walk through areas that are contaminated by uh, feces. Now, most of you are probably thinking, why would someone walk in an area where they're contaminated by feces? Well, other parts of the world, people use human feces as a fertilizer. It's rich in nutrients and then it can grow crops really well. But one of the problems of that is if someone's infected with worms, that now you've, been, you've now set the situation where these worms can then get back into the other people and cause more infections. Now, cycle C is probably another very common way. This is where you get cysts. The cysts get in the intestines. They release eggs. They get into another animal. Another animal will eat those eggs off the grass and that. And cysts into the muscle. You don't cook your steak long enough, and then you eat the cyst, and then that gets in. And then the last one, this is where you have a number of different um, uh, life cycles where, again, first one is in the humans. They can go into different organs such as the intestine and bladder. But typically what happens is that they end up uh, as eggs. The eggs get pooped out. They end up into a larva stage, which is into another or or organism like a snail or something else. And then those get into animals and then either burrow into the feet or get into animal flesh, you eat it, and then it gets in there. And so these are, again, some of these more complex ones. Typically what we see is either the cycle A or cycle C are the most common ways that people get it, but it's not uncommon for people to experience infection either through cycle B or cycle D as well. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about these as we go through the different types of parasites. Now again, the parasites, the helmets, these are the worms, and these arise from worms feeding on and migrating through the tissues. And again, the accumulation of worms and worm products are what cause the infections or cause the disease. Okay, diagnose is looking at blood cell counts. Again, if you remember back to chapter um, 15, I believe, when we're, or actually chapter 14, when we talked about white blood cells, one of the big ones that goes up is the eosinophils when you're infected by eukaryotic parasites. So that's something we look for. You do serological tests. Obviously, look at the feces to see if there are worms or worm products like eggs in the feces. Sputum, urine, blood, and other tissue biopsies will also show this. And again, there are some worm drugs that suppress, but essentially what you're doing is killing the worm and then you have to pass it out. If the worm gets stuck, you might be going in for surgery to get the worm out. And so that's one of those things that can be a uh, bad thing. So hopefully you can clear the worm and get it out using these drugs. Typically what happens is that these drugs will paral uh, paralyze the worm or kill the worm and then you just pass the worm out or the worms out depending on how bad the infection is. Okay. Here are a list of the different drugs that are out there, and you can see what they do to the worms. And again, they're toxic to the worms, but not so toxic to us. And so there are quite a few different drugs out there that people can take. And again, I'm not going to spend any time on this, but you can see there are some that are out there for people to use in case they do get these parasites. Okay, so the first group that we're going to look at is the roundworms. And these are known as the nematodes or the roundworm infestations, and they're about... Uh, 50 species that infect humans and again some of these are also found in the pets and again these are the same ones that we think of like heartworm or bloodworms or intestinal worms that we see in our dogs and cats. Now the reason why humans don't get these heartworms that dogs and cats get is because when we get bit by, bit by mosquitoes that actually carry these worms our immune system is aggressive enough and fights these off before they have a chance to hatch. Dogs and cats this is not the case the worms hatch they release out and then they grow in the heart or in intestinal worms. And you can see here, here's heartworms where these worms will invade the heart and actually fill up the passages of the heart. And so you can see this. And again, we have two different types of nematodes. We have intestinal ones that stay in the intestine. And then we have the round worms that get into other tissues. And again, that's the heartworms and some of these other ones. Again, you see they're long cylindrical worms circular muscles, complete digestive tract, and different species a lot of times associated with them. First one is a typical human pathogen. In our biology class that you can take here at MATC, we actually do uh, look at these roundworms. There's not much to them. They look like long white worms and that stuff, and they can grow very long. Typically, you find both male and female worms in the intestine. Most cases in the United States occur in the southeast, again, with contamination of 
uh, food or water associated with infected, uh, dirty water, infectious human uh, feces. And again, it's indigenous to humans. So we don't see it in a lot of other animals. We see it typically in humans. Again, it spends its larval and adult stages in humans, releases embryonic eggs in the feces, and it's spread to other humans through food, drink, and contaminated objects. These eggs hatch into larvae, burrow through the intestine, and then into circulation where they can get into the lungs and pharynx and then are swallowed and it starts a system all over again. So it can cause a lot of different things. I want to take a look and show you how many eggs per day, though, that can be released by these worms. So you're talking about every time you have a bowel movement, you're releasing 200,000 eggs per day. And that's pretty nasty. And so, again, these things can spread. And it's a numbers game. The more eggs that they release, the more likely the worms get into the population. And so releasing lots and lots of eggs allows you to survive in the population. Here you can see in this picture the worm inside the intestine. There's actually two worms here. You got one here and one here. Pretty nasty. And again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time showing you things, but you can see the difference. The female is a little bit bigger than the male in this situation. But again, typically it's the eggs and you can see the process and how they get in. Now, again, the worms retain motility. They do not attach to the intestines, so they're swimming throughout your intestines. Can cause severe inflammatory reactions that mark the migratory route. Here you can see the worms in the gloves. So these are very large worms. These are like the size of the earthworms that you see crawling around on the ground after it rains. You can get allergic reactions that can occur and then heavy worm loads, especially in young kids, can retard physical and mental development. And so again, here are the cysts that get in, you swallow these cysts and then the worms hatch from those cysts and then they can grow. And so again, you get more worms in the intestines. They're fighting for the same nutrients. It causes a de deprivation of nutrients, and that leads to the uh, physical and mental development issues that you can see, especially in kids. Okay, another one is the pinworm, and I would say this is probably the most common type of worm infestation. And I think I talked about this before in the United States. This is where the eggs are picked up in, uh, from surroundings and swallowed. And again, after hatching in the intestines, they develop into adults. The typical sign of this is the anal itching. And so what happens is that the female egg will crawl out of the large intestine, lay eggs at the end of the rectum, which causes the itching to occur, causes the, uh, again, the irritation in the skin. Kids will itch, itch their bottom. Itch the, itch the anus and the rectum. The eggs end up under the nails and then they can either be self-inoculated or can be spread to toys. And what do kids do? Put toys in their mouth and this is how it goes. Now, one way that we can test for this is looking for the little worms and the eggs on the anus. And so what we do is what is basically called the tape test where you stick a little tape on the anus to look for worms and you pull it off and you see if you have any eggs or worms on there and you know that this is what they are. These worms are very small. They look like little grains of rice. And again, you can have thousands of these worms growing in your intestine um, uh, during this time. And so you can see where these things are. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. All right, so humans become infected by which stage of the pinworm's life cycle? The egg, the larva, adult, or all stages are infectious. What do you think? In this case, all stages are infectious. And so again, Typically, though, where most people get this is through the eggs. It's the release of the eggs by the, getting the eggs under the nails. But you can see at any of these stages can be infectious. But typically, where most people get it is the eggs that are left on some of the objects, either under the nails and self-inoculation or on toys. So I'd give you, if you said all in stages, but also the eggs as well. Okay. All right, now the hookworms. These are the characteristic curved ends and hooked mouths. And so associated with these are the hooks around their mouths. And what the hooks do is hook on. They hook on and grab onto the intestines. And again, they shed eggs in the feces and then hatch into the flanelliform larvae. And they can burrow into the skin and the feet. So typically where we see this is people get this by walking barefoot in areas where you have human feces contamination. And again, these worms burrow through the feet, get into the blood supply, go to the lungs, and then you swallow them, okay? So again, larvae travel from the blood to the lungs, proceed up the bronchi into the throat, and then you swallow them. Not a pleasant way to think about it. Again, the worms mature, reproduce in the small intestine and complete the life cycle. It can cause pneumonia, nausea, vomiting, cramps, and bloody diarrhea. And again, Blood loss is significant. They've said that these worms can drink up to a half a liter to a liter of blood every day because what they do is attach to the intestine 
and then suck you dry basically from your intestines. And so you got lots of blood down there and they can drain you, basically drain you alive from the blood that they remove. And so this can cause significant blood loss and anemia associated with this. So hookworms are not something that you wanna play around with and that stuff. And again, can cause some serious, serious problems, especially in the body uh, when we think of blood and circulation. Okay. Another one that we see in the United States is trichinella and trichinella spiralis. And again, this causes trichinellosis. And again, this is found typically associated with pork. And so we think of these things as eating raw pork or ham or things like this. They're not cooked properly. These cysts are in the muscle and then they get, you basically eat these things, they hatch, get into the intestine, and then they leave the intestine and then go and cyst on you. And so that can be the bad thing reason why we're seeing more and more cases in the United States is where our pork is coming from. So people that live in the southwestern United States, like Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California, are now getting a lot more of their pork from Mexico, where we're finding that these animals actually are infected with the trichinella. They're not cooking their pork long enough. They get the cyst in them. They eat the meat, especially young kids. And we're seeing epilepsy on the increase because where these cysts can go and where these worms can go is they can go anywhere in the body. So we can see cysts in the, in the heart, the brain, and then even in the eyes. So pretty nasty stuff. And so again, you go to the Southwest, make sure you ask for your pork to be well cooked so you don't get these things in you. Okay, so again, it's acquired from eating undercooked uh, pork or bear meat. Here you can see the cysts in the muscle. Now, not, you're not going to be able to see this if you get a big pork chop or a big piece of rib meat and say, oh, I see cysts in there. And they're going to be too small to be seen with that. But again, if you cook it well enough, it should kill these cysts. Okay, the larvae will migrate from the intestine to the blood vessels. And now the worm thinks you are the next animal, like the pork, you know, or like the pig. And so it's going to leave, it could go into muscles, it can go in the heart, the brain, and form the cyst. Again, the first systems, uh, symptoms look like flu-like and diarrhea associated with the cyst erupting. And again, the second systems can include muscle and joint pain, shortness of breath, and then pronounced eosinia, uh, eosophilia, which is an increase in the white blood cells, the eosinophils. And again, there's no cure after the larvae have insisted or in, insisted into the muscle or the brain and the eye or other things. And again, what we're seeing is that we're seeing a number of small kids now gaining, uh, getting um, problems with epilepsy due to the cysts in their brain. And so that, that is not a good thing. And so we're seeing it more and more very common in the Southwest because they're eating uh, undercooked meat that contain these cysts from pork that's been imported from Mexico. And so they get this disease and then now it gets in the brain and it can cause epilepsy and a number of other things. So very scary. So you don't want to see uh, CNS damage or heart failure due to this infection. Okay. Another one are the tissue nematodes. And these are ones that get into the lymphatics, the skin. We call these the flanarial worms. And so these are where you have multiple worms that get into the other part of the body. And again, these can cause chronic deforming diseases. Probably the most common one that you hear about is elephantiasis. And elephantiasis is the one where you see these abnormally large extremities, either the legs or arms or scrotum. And this is caused by the Wucheria bancrofti. But we also have the worms that can cause river blindness and the loa loa, which is another eye worm. And again, if you watch that video, monsters are eating or parasites eating us alive, they actually have some videos showing you some of these things. And again, I'm sure that monsters inside of me. Uh, a video you can see that as well and so those are all real interesting shows to watch these wonderful parasites that get into people now the first one is the Wucheria bancrofti and again this causes the elephantiasis this is a tropical infection spread by mosquitoes the worms get in and where they go is to the lymphatic system and if you remember back to chapter 15 14 and 15 we talked about the lymphatics and that's responsible for moving the extracellular fluid that leaks from the vessels back into circulation well, if you plug those tubes, there's no way for that extracellular fluid to get back to the heart. And that causes that extreme swelling. Well, there's nowhere for that fluid to go. The tissue then becomes or necrotic. It doesn't, it has nowhere to get rid of that fluid. That swelling stays. The tissue becomes necrotic and cause problems, blockage of the lymphatic systems. And so you get this overwhelming, massive swelling in the extremities and cause obviously deformities, skin damage, causes neurotic lesions to form, 
and a lot of other things. And here you can see an example of where, again, this overwhelming swelling, this uh, massive swelling in the extremities occur from these worms basically filling up the lymphatic system. And once these worms get in and the swelling occurs, there's not much you can do. You can't go in with a rotor rooter system and try and clean out the lymphatic system. So once that swelling begins, and a lot of times you don't know until you start to see the swelling, there's not much you can do. Okay, again, uh, another one is this uh, Oncocheria vulvalis, uh, or the river blindness. This is transmitted by black flies. And again, the larvae develop in the adults of the subcutaneous tissues. And then the females migrate through the blood to the eyes and they cause river blindness. And so one of these things is the bacteria or the, not the bacteria, but the worm itself can crawl underneath the skin into the blood and get into the eyes. And then what happens, you get calcification in the eyes that causes this blindness to occur. There are treatments, but again, once it gets into the eyes, there's not much you can do. And so early treatment with these things, this is what you wanna do. And so again, way that we prevent this is preventing the flies themselves. And so you go after the larvae of the flies, filter your water and that stuff, and we don't see this as, uh, occurring as much anymore. And this is one of those things, again, you'd see in those videos uh, talking about that. Now the loa loa is again spread by these wonderful black flies. This temperature sensitive word migrates around and under the skin and can enter the eye. Here you can see actually the worm inside someone's eye. And again, gets in there, gets in, uh, basically gets in there and that stuff. The only way to get rid of this is by slowly removing the worm either under the skin or from the eye itself. And obviously that can be one of those procedures that can be very delicate. So again, pretty nasty stuff. And so again, controlling the flies, controlling the vector is the way to eliminate this worm and this disease. And so if we can do that, then we can see, um, uh, fixtures, but we do have treatments again, not pleasant, but there are some treatments to getting rid of getting rid of these worms. All right, the last group that we're going to look at with the flatworms are again. Now we're going to move on to the flatworms, which are the guys that are flat, not rounded, are both the flukes and the tapeworms. And so these guys again have flattened bodies. A lot of times they have um, compact digestive systems. They do have excretory, neuromuscular, and reproductive systems, and they do lack circulatory and respiratory systems because they're flat, so they can breathe through their skin. The animals such as snails or fish are usually intermediate hosts, and then the humans are the definitive hosts. And so you can kind of see here's the flatworms. Kind of look like leeches, but they're not in the same family as leeches, but this is where you see them. What we do find is that flukes can infect lots of different parts of the body, uh, with this. And again, a lot of times they're named based on what they like to infect. Okay. So the first one are the blood flukes and we call these schistosomes. And this is a prominent parasitic disease. The adult uh, flukes live in humans that release eggs into the water. And then the little larvae develop in freshwater snails and into the second larvae called the uh, saccharia. The saccharae then get into the skin and penetrate into the skin and move into the liver to mature and then they migrate into the intestine or bladder or shed eggs giving rise to chronic organ enlargement. So again, these are the ones that infect the snails. This comes from the human's intestines, the feces. These are the guys that actually leave the snail and then they burrow into the skin of the host. And here you can actually see the worm inside or what the worm looks like once it gets inside. So it's a more flattened like worm on the inside of the, of the organism or in the host. Okay, liver flukes are zoonotic. There are two different types that we uh, discuss. This uh, chlora, clo, uh, clonoricus, yeah, it's easy to say. So it goes between mammals, snails, and fish. Humans are infected by eating inadequately cooked fish and containing sericarinae. Uh, Larvae crawl in the bile duct, mature, and shed eggs into the feces. And then the snail is infected. So again, this is more with that sushi and that stuff. And then you have the fasciola hepatica, which cycles between herbivores, snails, and aquatic plants. And again, infected by eating raw aquatic uh, plants. And then the fluke lodges in the liver. And so you see these typically into the liver. These guys infect the bile duct. So you have more problems with the bile duct and pancreas. These guys are found in the liver. And so you can see these things are in different parts of the body where you see these things. 
Okay, another one is uh, one that gets into the lung. These are the lung flukes, and it's the para paragonomus uh, westermani. And again, this cycles between the carnivorous animals, snails, crustaceans, and again, eating undercooked crustaceans, intestinal worms migrate into the lungs. So make sure you cook your lobsters and crabs, I guess, and, and, and shrimp well enough so you don't get these things. So here you go, it gets in the shrimp, you ingest it, and then it can get into the lungs. And so again, always make sure you prepare your food properly. If it's done right, you should have no problems, but sometimes these things can occur due to, again, undercooked. So always avoid that sushi from the gas station. You never wanna eat that stuff because you never know what you're gonna get and how old it is. So always eat sushi and seafood and anything else are prepared properly, make sure it's cooked properly and done properly, and you should never have a problem with these things. But these things can occur if you eat these things that are not prepared properly. Okay, so an organism that causes elephantiasis has an enclosed digestive tract. Is this true or false? This is actually true. The flanarial worms have a complete digestive tract. They have an enclosed digestive tract. And again, these worms are the ones that block the lymphatic system. So if you said true, you are correct. All right. The last group they're going to look at with the tapeworms or the flatworms are the tapeworms. And again, these probably get the most notoriety. Everyone thinks of worms. They first think of the tapeworms. These are those long white worms that have these different, and they look like they have multiple segments to them. They're very long, very thin, ribbon-like bodies composed of sacs, which are called proglottids. And each proglottid has an independent unit adapt for absorbing food and making and releasing eggs. And there's two that we mostly talk about, the tinea sagnata and the tinea solium. One is a beef tapeworm. The other one is the pork tapeworm. We'll talk about both here. The first one is the beef tapeworm, the sagnata. And what's good about this one, I guess if there's anything good about a tapeworm, is that these guys stay inside the intestine, which is important because the other one can actually leave and cause problems. The beef tapeworm can be very large, can be up to 2,000 proglottids. Here you can see the tapeworm. So it goes from one end to the other. Here's the one end, and it goes all the way around. So you figure that the adult intestine can be up to 30 feet. Well, the tapeworm can grow that long. And so it can be a very, very long tapeworm and grow inside the body. It's a warm place where it can absorb all those wonderful nutrients. And again, these the humans are the definitive host. You can see it has hooks and suckers on the end to allow it to stick to the intestine. And essentially what they do is they allow this to be released. Now, back in the day, if you ever Google tapeworms and you look for ads back in the 1920s and 30s, this was used to, as a weight loss treatment. So people would take these cysts, swallow them like pills. These tapeworms would hatch in the intestines and it would cause them to lose weight. It's a great way to lose weight because you're going to lose a lot of weight very quickly. However, it's not very healthy because once you have this tapeworm, now you have a living organism inside of you. You have to get it rid of it somehow. There are drugs to kill it. But again, if you don't pass it, you're going to go in for surgery to get it removed. Now, I imagine, and I'm not trying to say this as a bad thing, but I imagine there's probably some people out there that have probably used these on the black market to lose a lot of weight. And I'm thinking of movie stars and that that have to lose a lot of weight for some of these roles real quickly. This would be a way to lose a lot of weight very quickly. It'd make yourself really sick, but you can drop a lot of pounds very quickly using this beef tapeworm. And again, if you want to get a tapeworm, the tapeworm you want to get is the beef because this one stays in the intestine. We talk about the pork tapeworm, that's scary because that can branch out and leave the intestine and actually enter into the muscle and other parts of the body. Now, again, how are we infected? They're infected by animal, animals are infected by grazing on the land, contaminated with human feces that have the eggs, okay? The infection occurs by eating raw beef, which is in the larval stage. So again, cook your meat properly and you shouldn't have any problems, okay? In humans, the larval attaches to the small intestine, becomes an adult causes very few symptoms, but again, some of the symptoms include abdominal pain, nausea, and then seeing percolatids in the stool. So again, those are the release of eggs in the stool, and so that would be a definitive characteristic. Now, the other one that's out there is the soleum, and the soleum is the pork tapeworm. And now this one is the bad one because this guy does not stay in the intestines. What happens is a lot of times these... Uh, uh, eggs and other things can then migrate into other parts of the body and become encysted. And where we've seen these guys encyst is in tissues including the heart, 
the eye and the brain. It can cause seizures, psychiatric disturbances, and a lot of other things, especially if it gets into the brain and causes these things. So if you remember the what I was talking about with the uh, with the trichinosis, the trichinosis also can be basically very similar with this psyllium. So again, undercooked pork, these tapeworms get in and then they leave the intestines. These then go and cyst in other parts of the body, including the brain. And that can be the, the nasty, scary thing. So you don't want to get these guys into the brain causing problems. It can cause a lot of serious uh, issues, including getting into lungs, getting into the brains, the tissue and other parts of the body. So avoid getting the pork tapeworm at all costs, because again, obviously this one is more deadly. This one can cause more, many more problems than the beef tapeworm. And again, Again, always cook your pork, okay? Or know where you're getting your pork from, so that's the key. All right, so the last uh, group that we'll talk about is the ectoparasites. I told you this is a long video, but we're almost done here. We'll talk very briefly about the ectoparasites, and they're called ectoparasites because they're found on the outside of the body. This includes the arthropods. So again, this is in the kingdom animalia. These are the jointed feet or the jointed legs uh, type of thing. They have the exoskeleton made of chitin, and these include the arachnids and crustaceans. Many must feed on blood or tissue of the host during the life cycle, and we call these ectoparasites because they live on the outside. And again, those of medical importance and uh, transmit uh, infectious microbes. And again, we've already mentioned some of these with the bacteria. And we're going to mention more of these when we get to the viruses. And again, you've heard about these things. And so we call these guys uh, biological vectors because they spread disease. Okay. Now the groups that we're going to look at is the arthropod vectors. These include the insects. Now insects are always described as having three pairs of legs or six legs total. They tend to have three body parts, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. And they typically have wings and antennae. So that's the way you can determine insects from other types of uh, arthropods and that. And we'll talk about the uh, arachnids here in just a minute. Now, the insects include things like mosquitoes, fleas, and lice. Now, mosquitoes don't spend a lot of time on our bodies, so I call these very temporary ectoparasites, but they do transmit a lot of diseases. We saw today they transmit a lot of parasite diseases, especially uh, when we look at mosquitoes transmitting um, uh, malaria, uh, sometimes it can spread other diseases like the Leishmania and some of these other ones. Another one that they can spread, again, when we talk about viruses, we talk about West Nile. They can spread some of these yellow fever. They can spread now the Zika virus that people are talking about and all those other wonderful things that are out there. So mosquitoes can spread a lot of nasty diseases. And again, the other one, filariasis, which again is the filarial worms, the tube worms causing, again, blocking the uh, lymph nodes and the denue fever, which is another one that uh, people can get. And uh, again, it's a virus that people can get. Fleas, again, tend to stay more on the body, but tend but we get them and they're hard to get rid of. These are highly modal, flattened bodies, feed on warm-blooded animals, and they can carry zoonotic diseases, including plague and murine typhus. So again, these are the little fleas, the little insects. And then the lice, which are more of the ectoparasites. And so if you watch some of these shows, sometimes they have it. And it's very common in childhood diseases, spreads very easily, again, from one person to another, coming in close contact with one another. And that's the body hair. And so you have lots of different types. You have the head lice, the body lice, and then you also have the uh, genital lice. And so those are all the different types. And again, they feed on blood and tissue fluid. They release feces that can contaminate the wound and they can cause relapsing fever and endemic typhus. So lots of different things. And this is the lice. Okay. Now the arachnids, arachnids are different. Typically arachnids, you only see two body parts. You see the head and then what we call the either the cephalothorax, which is the head and the thorax, or the abdomen type of thing. And so that's kind of what we see. They also, the big difference in arachnids and the insects is that you have eight legs, and then you also don't typically see wings in arachnids. And so that's the difference between those. So if you ever have a test on insects versus arachnids, you can always tell six legs, eight legs, wings, no wings, uh, and then the body plan. Three body part, three body plan, head, thorax, and abdomen, whereas in arachnids, it's typically head, the cephalothorax, which is the head, and then the abdomen, which is the big part in the back, and then that's how you know. 
The big arachnid that we worry about is ticks. We talked a lot about this with bacteria, the Lyme disease, uh, some of these, the Rocky Mountain spotted fever and that, the hard and soft ticks. And again, we're going to talk some more about some viral diseases that you can get with ticks. Again, they cling on vegetation, they attach the host and then get in contact. They bite and take a um, blood meal. And a lot of times you have these two different types taking again, bacterial and viral diseases, and then other ones can uh, transmit some relapsing fevers and that. So again, these are typically short-lived on the body, you tend to, you feel them, and then with a, again, very, very small. Sometimes you don't even know it until after the bite and then the infection. So that's one of the things you have to worry about. And so with these guys, sometimes you don't even know it because they're so short-term, but they can spread a lot of diseases. Okay. Again, here is a list of all the different guys. You guys can look at these things. And again, we're going to be spending some time looking at the specific diseases spread by these, especially when we're talking about viruses. And so we'll spend a little more time on that here in the next two chapters. But I want you to be aware that these guys are typically vectors that bite us, live on us for a short period of time. They're ectoparasites on the outside and spread diseases along with not only eating off of us, but spreading wonderful diseases that get inside of us as well. Okay, so we made it to the end. Hopefully you survived this and maybe you took some breaks and that's fine. Uh, but we have the three main types of parasites. First ones are the protozoans. And remember, it's based on how they move. So we have the amoebas, which are typically found in the intestine. Some do get into the brain. We talked about the flagellated ones. These are typically found in the blood. And these are include the trypanosomes. The, the cruzi, which is the Chagas disease, which causes enlargement of the the heart and the liver, and then we had the trypanosome brucei, which is uh, spread through biting black flies. This causes African sleeping sickness. We talked about the spore forming. This included the plasmodium, which is malaria, spread by mosquitoes. We had the toxoplasma, which causes toxoplasmosis. That's typically spread by your cats and that changing cat litter and contaminated food. And then we talked about cryptosporidium. And again, that's kind of near and dear to uh, the upper Midwest, but we do see this around the world. This can occur any part. Uh, you get contaminated water. This can occur, but again, major outbreak in Milwaukee back in the 90s. We then looked at the worms. We have the roundworms, which are, again, uh, guys like pinworm, the scarus. Those are typical intestinal worms. Also looked at flanarial worms very quickly. Talked briefly about heartworms. And, excuse me, heartworms in that. We also saw the um, ones that cause elephantiasis and the river blindness in that. So those are pretty nasty. And then the flatworms included the flukes, which can get in a lot of different body systems. And a lot of times they're named after the organs that they infect. So you can see them in the bladder, the blood, the liver, the lungs, lots of different places. And then we talked about tapeworms. There was the beef and the pork tapeworm. There's actually also a fish tapeworm out there that I didn't mention, but Again, the beef tapeworm stays in the intestine, can grow very, very long. You have several thousand proglottids and that, and each proglottid can release eggs. The other one is the pork tapeworm. That one can leave the intestine and insist into other parts of the body. That's by far the more dangerous of the two, and we looked at that. And then finally, we looked at the ectoparasites. These are on the outside. These tend to be outside the body and, again, include the insects and the arachnids. And, again, discussing a lot of these are... The reason why we worry so much about them is not so much that they live on the outside of us, but the diseases they can spread. And again, we've talked about, again, the bacterial diseases already. We're going to be looking at the viral diseases here in chapters 24 and 25. And so someone might ask me, what would you expect on a test and what do you want them to know? I would just uh, focus on the basics. How do we characterize these things? Are they single cell organisms? Are they multicellular animals? Are they living on the outside of the body? Obviously knowing each of the three categories where they come from. How do we describe the protozoa? How do they move things like this? And then some basic diseases. I'm not expecting you guys to know the whole infectious cycle or anything else. In the uh, malaria type of thing, I would know it definitely infects the liver, gets into the blood, rupture of the blood cells. That's how you get the um, the infection cycle and again the chills fever sweating why does that occur why does anemia occur in those situations but that's the things i would uh, worry about with the worms again don't worry so much about all the individual worms and that stuff if i did talk about it i would expect you to know a little bit about those and again 
uh, about the roundworms, the elephantiasis, the eye worms, and that stuff. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail about where these guys are infectious, how you get them or anything. But I think, you know, how is the most common way that you spread these worms through contaminated food or water? Sometimes they burrow through the feed and that stuff. That's always important. The flatworms include the flukes. How are they named by where they get into the systems to get into? Again, the tapeworms, the two different types. I talked about that, which is the more deadly of the two. And then the ectoparasites, why do we worry about them? Why are they called ectoparasites? Why, what kind of diseases can they spread? And again, uh, we'll be discussing more about those diseases in the other chapters. Okay. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Uh, send me comments on the videos and that stuff. I've gotten a couple comments from you guys. It sounds like I'm helping you out quite a bit, so that's great. I'm glad I can be a help to you and kind of understanding this a little bit better. It's not not saying that your instructor is doing a bad job or anything, but if you can be helped out by that, I find that fantastic. It helps you out. You know, I'm glad I can be a service to you guys. If you do have any questions, please feel free to, like I said, email me or contact me through comments. Be happy to get a, a hold of you. Uh, if you're one of my students, you can obviously ask me questions after lab or after um, uh, in office hours and that stuff. I'm happy to talk to you about this. And again, keep it simple. Don't worry about all these different things and saying, wow, there's a lot of worms and that stuff. There are a lot of worms, but I'm going to keep it basic. I don't want to overwhelm you guys with too much stuff. Okay. Well, from that, I thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.